Prime Minister Sir Keir Starmer. And so I will begin by playing this video, which I got from a friend, and it really sums up what has really happened in this country in the past 14 years. Now, what is remarkable about British politics is the sophistication of the British electorate. Now, Britain is the home of democracy, uh, the Magna, Magna Carta, uh, the rule of law, separation of powers, independence of the judiciary, and um, anything, basically freedom of the press, press, and anything that supports democratic rule. This is a nation, small, but leads the world in this area of politics. But what have we seen in the past 14 years is just basically the breaking down of all these systems that really establishes this nation in global politics. Uh, what are some of the issues here? We, When we look at the Rwanda uh, scheme with the Rishi Sunak and his uh, effort of overturning the ruling of the Supreme Court, of the this uh, Rwanda now uh, a law, which used to be the Rwanda Bill, it, it really shows you the length at which this Prime Minister was willing to go, just to somehow tarnish that um, independence of the judiciary. So many other events have gone on. These are sort of economic events. So, for example. Um, Lord Moylan, who is a, a Tory peer, uh, confirmed on the great debate, on, on the show of the great debate, which was hosted by Trevor Phillips in 2023, confirmed that that is about £840 billion pounds that was basically printed into the economy since 2009. Out of that amount, Rishi Sunak, when he was Chancellor, printed 450 billion pounds and this basically uh, was leading on to the covid era and a lot of this money went into sort of the ppe scandal these monies because they were actually printed cash they were bound to be inflationary now if you look at an economy that had um, interest rates so low that house prices literally doubled, the printing of this 450 billion uh, pounds was inflationary. And obviously it tends to feature a year or so after the printing of the cash. So these monies were printed under Rishi Shunak. Uh, monies went into PP and so many other dodgy uh, deals. Uh, these monies, I'm sure, took flight out of this country, but then came back maybe a year later to cause serious inflationary tendencies. The Bank of England was then forced to raise interest rates based on this inflationary tendencies, which I think, obviously, a great deal of it was not necessarily the fact that, you know, there was so much inflation uh, coming out of this uh, covid and Ukraine war, but the sheer fact that there were no regulators, nobody regulates prices in this country. So it got to the point where any um, market where they have the sort of monopoly power or cartel power, like the supermarkets, like the par airport parking charges, like, um, you know, uh, utility, household utility bills, everything was just like going up and up and up. And the ordinary guy, that is working hard in this country, basically is, is working as a slave because you work and then you don't get anything at the end of the month. But all these monies were being taken away from the hardworking people of this nation and creating millionaires and billionaires in this country. And so this guy's video really sums up what has happened in the past 14 years. Um, eventually, um, as I understand, Sunak then basically uh, signed off as a chancellor, knowing what was coming after him printing that 450 billion pounds. 
and then basically set up Lestras and Quasiquating to take the bait. And they did. And obviously, uh, things went wrong in a short space of time, in less than 50 days. And this started this um, up, upward trend of the rises of interest rates. And obviously, everybody is blaming Lestras and Quasiquating. But in reality, the actions really started with Rishi Sunak. The guy then comes back later on as a prime minister and is a, a real smooth talker. But a lot of the losses, the financial losses that this country have faced and, and the amount of suffering that has come to families, this guy is the guy responsible for all these things. So he comes back as a PM and is a smooth talker. And obviously they didn't even come in coming from a democratic perspective but it was more like a bit of an oligarch coup but now the impact of him being in that position has been felt today on the 5th of july 2024 where all the gains that were made by boris johnson in 2019 has basically fallen and um Basically, the Tory party has lost about 249 seats to the Labour Party and so many other small parties. So let's go on straight to this guy's uh, video because he sums it up better than I can. As we look back at the last 14 years of Conservative rule, as we look back at this gaggle of obdurate, arrogant, stubborn, unrepentant, heartless, self-serving bunch of arseholes who have spent the last 14 years trying to keep their useless, megalomaniacal political party together while sleepwalking the country into a kitchen blender. 14 years, five prime ministers, seven chancellors, eight foreign secretaries, 13 culture secretaries, one of whom was Nadine Doris, a woman so stupid she thinks Channel 4 is a brand of perfume. Eight home secretaries, including grinning exorcist doll, Pretty Patel, Sajid Javid, James Hilarious, Rape Jokes Cleverly, and far-right pin-up, Suella Braverman. Twice a woman who says multiculturalism has failed, even though her, Patel, Javid, Cleverly, Sunak, Kwartang, Zahawi, Badenoch are proof, proof that even if you do have brown skin, you too can become a vicious, festering, regressive, lying, greedy, nasty, eye-wateringly wealthy, but morally bankrupt cunt. No fewer than 16 housing ministers, which explains why the UK is the most difficult place to find a home in the developed world. In 2000, a home cost four times the average salary. Now it costs eight times the average salary and workers are 11 grand worse off a year after 15 years of almost completely unprecedented wage stagnation. We've gone from 29 billionaires to 177 billionaires, whilst the working classes endured crippling austerity. The highest taxes in 70 years, lowest corporate taxes in 50 years. The rich are richer and the poor are much poorer and your average high street is boarded up. We've endured David Cameron's hubris, Theresa May's chaos, Boris Johnson's lies and Liz Truss throwing £30 billion of your money down the shitter. £100 billion in lost trade due to Brexit. £40 billion in lost tax revenues due to Brexit. Whilst our farmers and our fishermen were sold down the river. The worst trade deficit since records began and our national debt is now at £3 trillion. Average student debt has gone from 5k to 50k. Homelessness has doubled, child poverty has tripled, an energy crisis that has little to do with the war in Ukraine and more to do with unfettered capitalism and unbridled greed. Highest energy bills in Europe with 6.7 million people currently living in fuel poverty. The party of law and order have overseen record backlogs in the Crown Court, delays of five years for rape cases, with rapists being spared jail because the prisons are full. Chronic shortages of judges on top of a narrative that says they're all enemies of the people. They sold off 600 police stations. They cut police numbers by 21,000, then increased police numbers by 20,000, which is not an increase in police numbers, no matter how how many times they tell you it is. Highest train fares in Europe, lowest state pension in Europe, 
Uh, longest waiting lists in NHS history, a nation with rotting teeth and people being hospitalised with malnutrition and scurvy, billions of taxpayers' money wasted on PPE contracts for their rich mates and they let the bodies pile high and kill tens of thousands of pensioners during the pandemic and then they lied about it. They cut our armed forces, they closed and sold off our fire stations, they closed then sold off our libraries, they didn't build those 40 new hospitals and they forced councils into bankruptcy. They wasted billions on HS2. They voted to allow bankers to have unlimited bonuses. They allowed BP and Shell to steal our oil and gas reserves without paying taxes, whilst Norway, of course, went the other way and has a sovereign wealth fund of over 1.6 trillion. And record amounts of our tammies and turds are being churned into our rivers and oceans by our privatised water companies. Windrush, Grenfell, Partygate, Barnard Castle, 30p Lee, bullying, affairs, groping and rape and tractor porn and Chris Pincher and corruption and dirty deals and racist donors and lies and lies and lies. And yes, the pandemic didn't help and the war in Ukraine hasn't helped. But don't believe them when they tell you that that's the reason that you are poorer this week than you were last week, whilst Rishi Sunak is richer this week than he was last week. Rishi Sunak cut taxes on champagne on the same day he cut funding to rebuild schools and he wants to bring back national service. What else are they going to bring back? Grandstand? Spam on the national health? Snickers going back to marathon? I look forward to voting these incompetent hubristic grifters out and I hope they spend a very long time in the wilderness and have a really good think about what they just did. Well, a trip down memory lane there with some highs and some lows from the last 14 years. Sorry. I have given this job my all, but you have sent a clear signal that the government of the United Kingdom must change, and yours is the only judgment that matters. I have heard your anger, your disappointment, and I take responsibility for this loss. To all the Conservative candidates and campaigners who worked tirelessly but without success, I am sorry that we could not deliver what your efforts deserved. It pains me to think how many good colleagues who contributed so much to their communities and our country will now no longer sit in the House of Commons. I thank them for their hard work and their service. Following this result, I will step down as party leader, not immediately, but once the formal arrangements for selecting my successor are in place. It is important that after 14 years in government, the Conservative Party rebuilds, but also that it takes up its crucial role in opposition, professionally and effectively. When I first stood here as your Prime Minister, I told you the most important task I had was to return stability to our economy. Inflation is back to target, mortgage rates are falling, and growth has returned. We have enhanced our standing in the world, rebuilding relations with allies. Okay, so then there you have it. I'm sorry. That's what we get uh, as a nation after maybe nearly two years in office. So you get it. I'm sorry. And that is supposed to uh, help families that are that maybe continue to lose a lot of money every month through high mortgage payments um, you know hard working people that are basically working hand to mouth every day and uh, you know um, high prices you know you go to the supermarkets you try to buy fuel, you know, and then what you get is, I'm sorry. So we get it. Anyway, uh, now that we know that the guy is sorry, we are going to go on just to show the sophistication of the British electorate. And so something amazing has happened. Yeah, so you get the I'm sorry thing. Yeah, that's fine. But what is really amazing today is just the 
actions of the British electorate in their sophistication and the way that they've done things. So basically, Labour, with their landslide victory of about 412 seats in the parliament, is, is a huge majority. However, they only made 35% of the overall votes. So therefore, the seats that they have gained, these are all uh, sort of margin seats and so really it's some sort of a, a warning to any party that leads this nation uh, to basically communicate to that party that these swings can really happen because uh, when Boris Johnson made that uh, you know th those massive swings in 2019 nobody ever thought that um, obviously conservative school lose 249 seats so in effect it's, it's a warning it's a warning it, it actually sends that message to Sir Keir Starmer uh, not to really take the people of this nation for granted the probably the other positive thing about it is that the way this country leads uh, sort of democracy in the world a lot of countries are always looking out to see what really happens in Britain so today we have a man, Keir Starmer, who is very measured uh, in everything that he does. Uh, then not only is he measured, but, you know, he's kind of, he's, he's, he's really level-headed and, you know, communicates effectively. And he has a, a decent level of control over the Labour Party because... If we look at where the Labour Party was in 2019, nobody would have ever expected Sekir Starmer to come this far. But he's held on, he's established complete control and discipline within the party. He sends out um, Jeremy Corbyn for, obviously there's always anti-Semitism issues with Jeremy Corbyn, you know, so he sends him out of the party. But... The people of Islington also answers differently uh, because uh, Corbyn went in as an independent and he has actually taken Islington, so he's back in Parliament. So, you know, this is a very sophisticated move by the electorate. The other thing is that you have people like Penny Morden who could have been tipped as the leader, uh, obviously, which we should sooner go in. She could have been the leader, but now she's lost her seat. Theresa May has lost her seat. Uh, Les Truss also lost her seat. Uh, and so this is, wow, this is really sort of uh, shocking, but at the same time, it's very sophisticated. And so this really goes on to really warn anyone that wants to lead this country to do their job and do it properly because they are not, I'm sorry, then doesn't really cut it. In, in my opinion, you know, if, you know, a proper research is done on Rishi Sunak in terms of me, uh, maybe the things that he has done, you know, sort of financially uh, against this country, um, a lot will be discovered because obviously there's been a lot of conflict of interest because many years ago, such a thing wouldn't have happened where you have a, a billionaire, you know, his wife is a billionaire, but I take it he's a billionaire and his contacts in, in the States, uh, obviously from the wife's uh, dad, really uh, is, is a big issue because with that conflict of interest, you are sitting at the helm making these decisions. So my only assumption is that if you're not like on a salary, which used to be what really happens to every MP and every PM, then basically you are making decisions to favor yourself. So this is, this is one of the problems of this country. But today, you know, this has been answered uh, and, and basically come as a warning to anyone that really wants to lead this country. Then the other interesting thing that is also happening is that you've had somebody like, well, great news for the Greens, 
excellent news for the Greens for taking four seats in Parliament and also taking seven percent of the overall of the overall um, uh, votes. We, it's, a, it's a big deal, uh, probably something like 1.4 million votes. So it means that Greens have done extremely well uh, with that uh, uh, level of um, improvement. They've done well. They must have probably come second at the back of uh, many of these constituencies. So that's great for the Greens. I mean, myself, <laughs> it's, it's funny because uh, I think... Um, you know, I had a conversation with a friend and they were like, oh, you know, he, they're trying to sell me this uh, Tory uh, uh, nonsense. But I said, for the first time, I said, even if you give me a gold bar, I'm not going to vote Tory. But obviously, this is somebody that have maybe, well, in the past voted Tory in, in many times. But on this occasion, it, it was a no-no for me. And it's just purely based on the record, the way they took this country for granted. And just felt that they can, you know, basically talk us, uh, basically being taken like fools. But uh, today, you know, uh, this is a, is a, is a big lesson uh, for them. Because I remember when the likes of John Major and Michael Heseltine uh, uh, spoke to Boris Johnson in the times of the mess to say, come on, get a grip on this party and stop this every two minutes having a prime minister because these prime ministers they cost this nation a lot of money you know you have like for example this nation will now have to pay five prime ministers instead of one you know so this is the seriousness and when the likes of michael huzzeltine and, and and john major try to communicate they were actually told that this story that is going now it's not those it's not like those do tories of those days you know this is a modern tory and where they feel that they had the power to do everything but now um we all hope that as they go into a position that they will stay there for a long time uh, so that when they they will learn so that next time when they come to power they will really work for the good interest of this nation uh, what else do we have here? We also have Nigel Farage. Um, he actually, I recall when he comes in to drop his uh, uh, note in promising uh, to do stuff for Clacton on sea. And uh, somebody else comes in and drop, don't vote for Nigel Farage. And then, then you get another letter with your name on it from Nigel Farage and some other guy still promoting Nigel Farage. But... Clarkton has also voted strategically to get Nigel Farage after his uh, eight-time attempt to become an MP. Today, Nigel Farage becomes an MP for Clarkton on Sea. Um, all these are very strategic in, in the sense that he doesn't live here. He's not from here, but he's been given the seat. But the point is the previous guy, uh, in speaking to a neighbor, the previous guy that was here wasn't easy, uh, obviously being the MP for Clacton was not even from Clacton as well. But Nigel Farage obviously is a loud mouth, he's a loud voice. And um, I think somehow he will also bring um, Clacton back onto the map in Westminster and, and, and draw in some developments in this probably the most deprived corner in Essex. So that is also another strategic um a move from the electric. So uh, these are exciting times. And so uh, I'm very happy to see the back of uh, Mr. Rishi Sunak. Um, I mean, the guy is believable. I'm very sure when, if, if I didn't discover the fact that he had printed that 450 billion pounds, you don't need to print cash. The reason is that we are in an economy where, you know, we, 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 we do things on credits. If you see what I mean, if you credit my bank account, then that's fine. I know, OK, there's credit there. You don't have to print the cash. But this cash was printed so that it could go out to this PPE dodgy contracts and some people that are not in this country. And then eventually this money then comes back into this country through the purchases of properties and all, all, all the mess that goes on 
so you know this is a it was like a big problem and a lot of things just just like went wrong and the whole place looks like um it, it was like very in a state of anarchy and so we didn't come in back as pm a lot of people that don't really understand how economics work uh, would have seen him as a savior but indeed he is really not a savior you know and so i hope that somebody may do a video that will really give you know a full account of his own financial dealings and how better off he has become and his family in this uh, time at the end of the day what is key is that it's not like you know people are jealous of people making money but the fact is that when you, you know, it's a nation that looks after the baseline. You need to have a baseline. And you, whatever you do, you must ensure that the baseline is also comfortable. That if the ordinary person gets out and go to work, that they have enough money to put food on the table. They have enough money to have a decent holiday. They have enough money to have a bit, take a bit of time off. Uh, and they have enough pension. I know of a person whose pension uh, pot was about probably something like yeah nearly 500,000 and this pot has been cut into two so the the pot is sudden the fund has performed so badly that you know they, they they've had a drop that significant drop it's almost halved the pension that they work hard to put away and these are the activities of of this type of um a conflict of interest with the people that are billionaires at the helm making decisions for the country. And, and so when you have this type of a system, this causes a great problem. Um, the next set of video is going to be focusing on Sir Kiestama, who, as far as I can see, comes across as a very level-headed guy, uh, very determined and... Um, yeah, he, 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 and he, he has that control. If he can gain that control over the Labour Party, it's kind of a hope that this is the guy that can really take this country to the next level. And the whole world is watching what this nation is doing because, um, you know, if you bring these people to account, you know, accountability, bring them to an account and, 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 and basically strengthen regulation, and, and, you know, rent control, so many things needs to be done because now the nation has lost so much money that to get it back, you need to investigate on people. You need to basically uh, make them accountable. You need to um, take back any money that has been taken off the state. This is sort of ill-gained funds. You need to be looking at the entire tax structure to see where... Uh, money school be recovered to rebuild this nation so whatever we're doing here the whole world is watching and so um yes we are going to look at what options uh, and and basically who kiestama is and what he can potentially do the great thing uh, today that we also heard is from the city obviously kiestama because he's very level-headed you know and very composed, you know, he can be seen as very gray. But at this moment, we need somebody that is gray, that is determined, that is disciplined. You know, disciplined. Somebody that you know, if you if you don't do what you have to do, then you're going to be out. Because he, Kiestama said, he said, um, we are going to have a shift from the politics of performance to a politics of, you know, public service. So, indeed... That is what this nation needs. And policy, a lot of things just have to change. The whole policy thing needs to be revamped, uh, you know, to, to ensure that, you know, this income inequality, uh, the, the gaps that has been created since COVID is sort of bridged. And, you know, all the regulators needs to be up and running. Ombudsmen, people that have had unjust uh, 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 events uh, happening to them without redress. This is 